So this uh, Sunday, I thought we would turn to an Advent uh, theme, uh, which we will uh, from now for a few weeks as we think about the coming of the Lord Jesus. And I just titled our thoughts, Why the Nativity? Perhaps that might give shape to uh, what we're thinking about uh, over the coming weeks. It would be interesting, I think, to go into town and perhaps just canvas people, canvas people on the door and conversation and ask them what they wish for in life. What do you think people are wishing for in life? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there could be quite a range of answers, you know, with present conflicts in the world and so on. You know, in some of those big ones might be, you know, global peace, uh, an end to war, an end to poverty. Uh, those kinds of things, I, I dare say, might come from some. Um, perhaps with pressures on immediate needs and family finances amongst some and thoughts closer to home, there might be quite a few who'd say, well, I could do with a £5,000 pay rise. Uh, I'm sure there's a few who would canvas for something like that. Uh, or, uh, or maybe the winning lottery ticket. You know, that's how, that people of, often have their hopes and their wishes in those things, don't they? Um, I suspect that might be there. Uh, others might just kind of have no, no, no outward thoughts to the world and society or just uh, look for their own pleasures and say, well, I could just do with a holiday in the sun or something like that, couldn't they? Or certain things they would like to do, places they would like to go. But I think it would be true to say that for many people, what they're looking for is something something, whether that be something tangible that you can possess and have and hold and own and, and buy and purchase, or whether that be something perhaps less tangible, but nevertheless real, like world peace, like an end to poverty, or, or some goal that they would like to achieve. And they're not necessarily wrong desires, are they, in themselves? You can't say, well, you know, any one of those uh, are wrong things. I'm sure there would be some things emerge that might be wrong, but for those kind of thoughts wouldn't be wrong. But the question is, can any of those desires ever find satisfaction? Will they ever be satisfied? Will there ever be an end to war? Will there ever be global peace? Will there ever, ever be an end to poverty? Will there ever be, um, uh, uh, as it were, a winning lottery? You know, will there ever be um, such a reward that we would never look back and think, ah, oh, this is just wonderful. Life can go on in peace and with achievement and so on. Is, it, is, is the world going to change through, through education? Is it going to change through economics? Is it going to change through politics? Uh, I think we all kind of are sanguine enough to know that that isn't really going to be the answer. So will they never come about? Well, um, I think we have an inbuilt, an innate desire for things to be better. C.S. Lewis often kind of said, God has planted that desire in us, and he hasn't planted a desire in us that will not find fulfillment. You know, the desires that we have are there that we might find fulfillment and satisfaction, satisfaction for them in God. I'm kind of paraphrasing his thought there. And the Bible's answer to this kind of search, will these things ever come about? Will they ever be? Is that they won't come about through something, but they will come about through someone. It's someone who's going to bring that about, isn't it? And so this morning, I'd like to remind us uh, that Throughout the Old Testament and leading to the New, God underscores that the answer to our deepest needs, the answer to your deepest needs, whatever they are, is not about having something, but about knowing someone. That's what's most important. And that hope that we find in Scripture is embodied in the birth of a promised son. That's a kind of motif, if you like, the birth of a promised son. That there's a man coming, the Bible promises there's a man coming 
that will do something for mankind that we cannot achieve and will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And the pattern of that hope we can see begins, and the pattern is the promised son. It begins right here in Genesis chapter 3, which we read from earlier. It, it, it occurs noticeably right at the moment of mankind's, as it were, worst and most awful moment, the fall of mankind into sin. God had made the very first man, and from that very first man, the very first woman, in chapters 1 and 2, and they're in a state of innocence and in, and in a world of paradise there as God had made this world for them to enjoy and possess and be in dominion over. But as we know, there was a test of their will and a test of their obedience that was either going to establish them in righteousness in obe or unrighteousness, in obedience or disobedience. And as we know, through the serpent, they were tempted and having eaten the forbidden, forbidden fruit, they transgressed God's only commandments and fell into sin and wrongdoing, didn't they? And as a result, as we read there, they, they feel their shame and their nakedness and their guilt before God. God is wanting fellowship with them and they're hiding. They're covering themselves with fig leaves, as uh, uh, Keith reminded us uh, last Sunday. And as a result of this sin, mankind is prone thereafter to continue wrongdoing, to be subject to the penalty of sin, which is death. But right in the middle of that court scene moment in chapter 3, where God calls them to account and calls them back to himself, there is, uh, there is judgment, but there is also mercy, isn't there? There is mercy, because uh, we see whilst there's punishment meted out on both the serpent and the woman and the man, yet there is a sliver of hope, isn't there, in verse 15. God promises here, he says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. There's going to be conflict, as it were, spiritual war going on between the devil and his kind, as it were, and humankind. And, and, uh, but there's ultimately going to be a human seed, her seed, who is going to bruise your head, O serpent, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, uh, theologians call this the proto-evangel or the proto-evangelium, evangelium, how we pronounce, meaning it's, it's the first, it's, it's like the seed of hope from which everything else later emerges. It's the fountain which, which comes to be a stream and, and then a river and a flood by the time we come to the New Testament. It's the first glimmer of the gospel message. And it begins here and winds its way through the Old Testament to the New. And it tells us, firstly, that mankind's hope is in God's promise, but it's in God's promise of a seed, a son. He shall bruise your head. There is a seed of the woman. There is a, going to be a descendant born into this world, born of a virgin, as we know, is later, as is later fulfilled. And he is the one who's going to bring, uh, bring us hope. He is the one who will do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And the first thing he identifies here that he will do, which we can't do for ourselves, is to bruise the serpent's head, chapter 3 and verse 15. And it's worth thinking about this, isn't it, for a moment. When mankind fell under Satan's sway, Satan became this implacable enemy. He holds us in his power through sin, through desire, through temptation. And we cannot extricate ourselves from his powerful grip. And neither can we defeat him in our own strength. But with great mercy, mercy towards mankind, who at this point has already turned rebel 
You know, we, we, we rebelled against God's will, rebelled against God's plan here. But even when we turned rebel, God promised that he would bring about a seed of the woman, a son, who would one day be born, who would take on this spiritual enemy for us and crush his head. That's what that word bruise kind of means. Paul, we'll pick up a bit later on, uses that phrase in Romans. Uh, there's a seed coming who's going to crush Satan's head, though it would also be for the bruising, the crushing of his own heel. He is going to kill you, uh, but you are going to, but, uh, and he's going to find him own, his own self pained, as it were, uh, in order to do it. Now we ought to think about this for a moment, didn't we? We we think mankind thinks humankind thinks that we are free agents that we can do as we please that we can do whatever we want to do that we have free will free choices in this world but the reality is second timothy chapter 2 verse 26 tells us we are held captive by the devil to do his will that is the natural state of man held captive it's like we're owned by a slave owner aren't we he is a he is a master over us an enemy who holds us in his power an enemy who opposes god an enemy who opposes all god's works and all god's plans but an enemy who holds us also in his powerful grip now in Luke chapter 11, when the Jews accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he showed them their logic was faulty and flawed, didn't he? How can someone plunder a strong man's house except he first bind the strong man? Only then will he be able to plunder his house and his goods. And of course, the question that naturally flows out of that, well, is, is who is able to do this? Well, he's saying that Satan is a strong man. He, he holds the souls of mankind in his power. Demon possession means the kind of possession of a person's spirit by a demon, doesn't it? And one of the remarkable things Jesus d did in his ministry was to cast out demons. And they, uh, they're questioning his power of doing that and saying, ah, oh, you're casting out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. You're, you're doing it by the devil's power himself. But no, Jesus is saying, no, there's a strong man. Satan is a strong man. He holds the souls of mankind in his power. There's only God who is stronger who can overcome that enemy and so the son of god doing such before them casting out demons out of people and putting them right demonstrating that the finger of god which is a phrase used in that passage was at work and the kingdom of god was therefore at hand and so jesus we know went to the cross and it was at the cross that he delivered a fatal bruising blow to Satan's head. Christ took on the enemy that we could not fight by ourselves. And that's one main reason why we all need him, you see. There's a, there's a kind of Goliath out there that you aren't equipped to fight. You know, and if you were to think about it, who is going to fight that battle for you? Who is going to overcome Satan, the enemy for you. If the Bible is truly saying you and me are held captive by him to do his will, and we know that he employs sin and desire and temptation to perpetuate people being held in that power because the wages of sin is death and it brings God's judgment and wrath upon us, that's why he, he works in that way. Well, you cannot do it yourself. You can't even see this enemy. It's, he's an invisible enemy, isn't he? And that's why people don't even believe that he's there. Well, that's how crafty he is, that he, he even hides, as it were, his own identity. And that shows how spiritually blind we are, that we don't even see him as an enemy. 
I'm sure if you were to uh, strap something around your eyes and your ears and so you couldn't see and hear and were put in a boxing ring and tried to take out an opponent by boxing, that other person would run circles around you because you can't see the enemy that you're trying to fight. And that is precisely it with our spiritual enemy. Left to your own strength, left to your own capacities, you will never defeat him. You will remain captive to the devil and you will share in his fate. Now Matthew chapter 25, the words of Jesus. It's only Jesus who really spoke about hell. There was no one else who really had the authority to speak so succinctly and clearly about this. He says this in Matthew 25 and verse 41. Then he will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting life, everlasting fire, sorry, prepared for the devil and his angels. You know, that is the end of the devil, and that is the end of the angels, and there's no other place if you're not with the Lord God and the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, then you're cast out into everlasting fire, into the place that wasn't, wasn't prepared for you, it was prepared as a punishment place for the devil and his angels, but that's where we will share an eternal destination with. If, we're, if we remain dead in our trespasses and sins. But the seed of the woman, the promised son, Jesus Christ, God's only son, came to bruise Satan's head and will one day finally destroy him. Romans 16 and verse 20, Paul writing to the Romans says this, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What, what verse is he, remind, is he, is he got in mind? That I think he's, he's going right back to Genesis 3 then, remembering. And he's saying, you know, that through the power of the Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus, he will enable you, the Roman Christians, to, uh, to uh, persevere and to prevail over the things of the enemy now that you are in Christ. But also I think he's looking towards the end the very end of all things, which we read of in Revelation 20 and verse 10. And the devil who, was de who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. There's a sober warning there, isn't there, about the consequences of sin and about the enemy who holds us captive. Who is going to deliver you from the power of the enemy? There is only one. And the nativity reminds us that our hope is not in something, but in someone, in the one, the person that God has sent to deliver us and to fight the enemy, to bruise the enemy's head and do for us what you could not do for yourself. Now, next in the Bible storyline, we see this same pattern written into Abraham and Sarah's life. Abraham and Sarah had a 25-year-long wait for God to fulfill the promises that he gave to them. They were childless, weren't they? They were already aging when God called them from Ur, to follow him to a land that he promised. If you want to find that, it's in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Very famous and well-known um, passage. The Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country and from your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. Now later when Abraham inquired whilst he's waiting for this hope to be fulfilled. He inquires about this and wants to be sure about it. In chapter 15 and verse 4 uh, he's starting to... Uh, plead with God about this and, 
and, and he says, look, I've only, I've only got a servant in my house who's my heir. This one shall not be your heir, says God, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. It, it continues in chapter 17, verses 15 and onwards. Then God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall call her name Sarai. You shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, no, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac. And it's there in chapter 18, verses 13 and 14 too. So um, their hope is bound up in the birth of a son, isn't it? Every, the, 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 the blessing, the hope for the world in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. The hope for the world is bound up in the blessing and the birth of a son. And when Isaac is eventually born, we know the storyline that God tests Abraham, doesn't he? Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him to me as a burnt offering on a mountain that I shall show you. And he asks Abraham, doesn't he, to offer up this promised son, as a burnt sacrifice. It's like everything is going to be taken from him and from the world, hope destroyed. But in his mind, he's, he's holding on to the promises of God and believing, well, if God's going to fulfill these things through Isaac, then Isaac's going to have to be raised up again from the dead. Anyway, it doesn't quite come to that. God intervenes at the last minute, doesn't he? But in chapter 22, verses 15, it's the angel of the Lord calls to Abraham, and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, in blessing I will bless you, and in multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of your enemies, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice." What is this telling us? Well, a second thing that this is telling us, that the, as it were, the nativity is about, this promised son motif is about, is not just that this promised son is going to bruise the enemy's, Satan's head, but that through this promised son, Christ would come to bless all families of the earth. If we asked what the nativity was all about and why the birth of Christ is so important, a further reason is because God our maker and sustainer in his mercy actually wants to bless mankind. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You know, those, though the, the, the truth is the soul that sins, it shall die, and we, and, and we are destined, as it were, for the judgment and wrath of God. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. God doesn't want to leave it that way. He, his desire, his will is to pour out a blessing, isn't it? Just as he provides sun and rain and food and shelter for all of creation, so he wants to bless mankind and fill our hearts with good things and rejoicing, the greatest of which is to know about being forgiven our sins and brought into a place of blessing before God. And it is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and through his death on the cross, that as it were, the dam of God's blessing, once held back by sin, is opened like a floodgate to pour out blessings on his people. There's a lot of symbolism, isn't there, when we think of Christ dying on the cross and the, the curtain in the temple, torn from top to bottom, the way into the holiest made open. There's a lot of theology in that, but one, one of those things would be our access to God, but it is also God's blessings, as it were, poured out to mankind. 
through his presence, through his promises, through, through, as it were, the hindrance, which is sin, being taken out of the way. And so when we seek Christ and find him, rather than seeking something earthly, we discover that in him is every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. And that one day with him we will have all eternity to enjoy peace and prosperity, a pain-free existence in the new heavens and the new earth that he will establish. What is it that people are wishing for? I wish that my granny didn't die. I wish that there would be world peace. I wish that people would be able to live without poverty. Well, all of these things have come about through sin. But if we have trust in the one who has come to resolve the matter of sin, then we can enjoy the blessings. Now, right now, that might just be the promise and the status of, of the inheritor of those blessings. We're not necessarily delivered from physical death. We may face that, but we're delivered from the judgment of, of, of the second death, aren't we? we? We may still face poverty in this present world, but we're going to be brought into a world where there will be no poverty where there will be peace and no war, where, where the, the, the pains and troubles of this life that we experience will be taken away. Now, can you do this for yourself? Of course not. Hebrews 7 and verse 7 says, it is beyond dispute that the lesser is blessed by the better, the greater. Here is Abraham giving uh, a tithe to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek blesses Abraham. And he's saying Melchizedek must be better and greater than Abraham for him to bless Abraham. So even though you Jews are holding Abraham here on this high point, well, then there's one even better than him, Melchizedek, made like unto the Son of God, without beginning or end, who confers a blessing on Abraham. And it's the same for us. The blessings that we see can only be given by one who is greater than man. It is only the Lord himself who can open the floodgates of heaven and pour out the eternal treasures that will not be stoken, stolen, not be eaten by moth, not be rusted away, not be decayed and taken from us. What we truly seek, we will find in him, and greater besides, because it's not really the gift, but a relationship to the giver himself, where true peace, joy, and satisfaction is found. So if we don't come to the Son, then we really have not entered in, have we? How shall we receive those blessings? Well, it's to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the door, isn't he, to all God's abundance. Enter into me. Enter in through me. I'm the door. Come in and go out and find abundance. Find pasture. That's the language he uses, isn't it? In John chapter 10. Here's the road leading to the celestial city. He's the ship sailing to the safe haven we need to be in. Outside of him, we remain out of the way. We're adrift on the rocky seas, on the stormy seas with the rocks there, as it were. We're abroad, we're not at home, but with him we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. How sad it is that God's great plan, Genesis 12, in you, Abraham, all families of the earth shall be blessed. How sad it is that the very thing that God is working out through Abraham and Abraham's people to bring forth a son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might have hope in him and receive God's blessing. How sad it is that people, I don't want to know. I'm plugging my ears. No, I don't believe in God. I don't believe all that Bible stuff and nonsense. And, and people are so hard-hearted against these things. Well, the outcome of that is you don't receive the blessings you may receive the blessings of common grace, the sun and warm and, 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 and nice things in this life that God gives to all, but those eternal blessings that God wants to bring to you, well, you will not receive them. So don't be a fool and remain afar off. Come near. 
Christ has brought you near through his death on the cross that you might enter in and be saved and, and enjoy the abundant life that he promises. Absolutely. Well, stepping a little bit further on in time and perhaps more briefly, in the next period of Israel's history in the land and in the time of the judges, there's another incident in which it's not just a family but also a nation who are taught to hope in a promised son. And this is in the Judges and in chapter 13. You're welcome to turn there. We didn't read it, um, but you're probably somewhat familiar with the story. So in the, in the period of the Judges, the people of Israel have been brought into the land, but the characteristics of the time is every man just does what is right in his own eyes. And they're not really living for the Lord, and they're going through cycles of sin, and God brings about enemies to punish the people, and then they cry out to God for deliverance, and God raises up a deliverer. And just notice um, Judges chapter 13 and verse 5, because God spoke to a woman and her husband Manoah about a son that she would bear. This son is Samson. And he's going to be a Nazarite from his womb. Chapter 13 and verse 5. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come to his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. And I would wager that it is just that kind of language that Zechariah picks up in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, uh, the birth of John the Baptist, when he uh, says uh, these things, it's actually chapter 1, sorry, verses 74 and 75, to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Why else did Christ come? He came to bruise the enemy's head. He came to bless all families of the earth. He also came to deliver us that we might serve God in holiness and righteousness. And what we have there is not just deliverance from the hand of our enemies promised, but also deliverance to serve God in that quote there in Luke chapter 1 from Zechariah, to serve God in righteousness all the days of our life. There is not just an enemy that we need deliverance from. There is an enmity that sin brings about between us and God. That enmity makes us hostile, antagonistic to God by nature. And we've got to recognize that whatever we serve and obey, we are slaves to, whether of sin unto death or righteousness unto life, Paul tells us in Romans 6.16. So when we serve sin, we are slave to sin and serve the end that sin brings, which is death. But once we have been delivered from sin, it is to serve God in righteousness and holiness all the days of our life. And the end of righteousness, he goes on to say, is life, eternal life, as it were. And so that's worth thinking about as well, isn't it? Are we really free and able to make choices? Not only by nature do we have an enemy that holds us captive, he holds us captive through sin and sinful desire. That's what we perpetuate and do. The reality is our wills are enslaved by nature, aren't they? to self and inner desire and pleasures. We may think that we can overcome those things by our, uh, by our strength, by uh, our resolve, but all that happens is that we have some kind of victory over one and another kind of sin takes over or we become aware of or, or kind of emerges in our conscience and we then find that though we may have succeeded in, as it were, placating one type of desire, another comes in its place. 
Have you ever played that game where you have to kind of, I don't know, the frog heads all kind of sit up and you, and you have to hit one? Don't, oh, it's the moles, isn't it? You know, the, the, the pop up. And as soon as you hit one, another comes up. As soon as you hear that, another comes up. Well, that's like sinful desire, isn't it? In, in, within us. We need someone to deliver us both from the penalty of sin, which is death, but also the power of sin within. That's why Paul cries out at the end of, uh, of Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Well, the answer comes straight away. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's our hope. It's not in something, it's in someone, isn't it? Christ came to deliver us from indwelling sin, that we might be that new creation in him, born again with a new inward desire, an inward desire to please him and no longer serve ourselves or serve sin. And having been made new, to have within us by the power of his spirit, new holy desires to live for God in holiness and righteousness. Now, it doesn't mean that the Christian becomes perfect, it doesn't mean the Christian becomes sinless, far from it. But the Christian nevertheless is born again, is filled with his spirit, is given new desires, has, has a new law, as it were, written on his heart or her heart. And we've been raised up to newness of life, having died to sin and now being shaped into the image of Christ. What does it mean to deliver? To deliver means to rescue or to save, to be rescued or delivered from something. And that's why the New Testament opens with the birth of a son, God's promised son. And he shall bring, and she shall bring forth a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save, rescue, deliver his people from their sins. There's no one else who's going to do that for you. You cannot do that for yourself. That's why we're looking to him. And that's why the Bible is, is giving that shape that we've got to look to him, isn't it? We have reason, don't we, to rejoice and be glad. The Redeemer has come. Advent reminds us that that Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ, that God sent his son to bruise Satan's head, to bless God's people, to deliver us from our sin. Just three of the many reasons why we need him and what he came to do for us, which we cannot do for ourselves. Will you trust him? Well, you come to him. There's no one else to come to. He's the one who's going to stand there and be the judge at the end. And so it's right, isn't it, that we come to him by faith and trust in him. And let us remind those who we know and love in our families and wider circles that the real hope of Christmas is the hope in the promised son that was delivered of a woman right there in the manger for us to believe in. Well, let's close in prayer this morning. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank you for this reminder of uh, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, your promised son. Uh, it began right from the very beginning, on the day of our fall, and our accounting before you, our God, against whom we turned as rebels and went astray and transgressed your holy law. And yet in your mercy, Father, you promised to send forth your Son. And we thank you that in the fullness of time, you did send him forth, born of a woman, born under the law, to deliver all those who were under the law, who were their lifetime subject to bondage, it says. Bondage to sin captive to the devil. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you you sent your Son to deliver us, to crush Satan's head, ultimately to bless us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. We give you the glory and the thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.